This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, creators of the annual Brewers Retreat. To brew on the main coast June 9th through 12th with legends like Vinny Salerzo of Russian River, get tickets now at brewersretreat.com. Welcome to the Craft Beer Brewing Podcast. I'm your host, co-founder and editorial director of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, Jamie Bogner. My guest today is someone else who's going to be brewing with us up at the Brewers Retreat uh, in Maine this June, Sam Richardson of Other Half Brewing. Welcome to the podcast, uh, Sam. Thanks for having me, Jamie. Cool. Uh, before we get started, uh, it's our sponsors that make it possible for us to bring you these conversations every week, and we appreciate their support. As the uh, brewing industry's premier choice for glycol chilling, G&D Chillers has set the standard on quality, service, and dedication to their customers' craft. For 25 years, G&D has led the way on custom, innovative solutions that match brewing customers' immediate and future needs. Thinking outside of the box, whether it's a simple relocation of the utility connections for a complex buildup or ground-level design and engineering, G&D is ready to meet the challenge. Contact G&D Chillers today for your chiller sizing needs at 800-555-0973 or reach out online at gdchillers.com. Also, this episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, host of HomebrewCon, a three-day event celebrating the best hobby there is. Visit homebrewcon.org to learn more. We're sitting in the old tap room for other half, a uh, what seems uh, like a piece of history now for you as you've kind of expanded up and around it. Um, give me a little bit of that story about how you got into brewing and uh, what led you to this point here uh, to, to you know keep this business making beer out here uh, in a corner of Brooklyn next to the Gowanus Canal um, and what continues to motivate you now, Sam? So I, I started, uh, I'm actually from Oregon originally, I grew up in yeah. Portland and a good friend and I started at home brewing when I was 19, 20 and we didn't do I have, to, I have to admit, I didn't do a lot of home brewing. We started doing it, and I was immediately frustrated with how inefficient it was. And we probably did six, seven batches of beer, and I uh, hadn't really decided what I wanted to do with my, with my life. And <clears throat> I, I found it as a good opportunity to go learn about it in school. And being in Oregon is a, is a good advantage because Oregon State has fermentation science as part of their food science department. So I just up and decided to do that, and six batches in, and you're going to going to go to school for it. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not the kind of person that likes to just sit around. Yeah, and I didn't want to have I didn't want to end up doing an office job. I wanted to do something where it was physical, but also creative, and uh, it just seemed like the perfect opportunity. And growing sure. up, growing up in Oregon, which at that. You know that was definitely the epicenter of craft beer, or one of the major epicenters of craft beer. So it was in our it was in our faces all the time, and I just it just seemed like the right thing to do. And I, I mean I've never regretted it. Yeah, it was it was definitely the right decision. And I had some moments, I had some moments where I was unsure. I mean it's not always it's not always easy being being a being a brewer, and not every craft brewing job is as exciting as it seems, but. Um, you know, we're, I, I just, I have no regrets. It's definitely the right choice. So I, I basically started, um, started the fermentation science program, finished it. And then I got a job working at a brew pub chain in Seattle. And I was there for about a year and I left that to go back to Portland. And I worked for pyramid in Portland for three years. And then how I ended up in New York, uh, my wife is from New York originally we were out here visiting family, and there was a random job posting for head brewer uh, at Greenpoint Beer Works in Brooklyn, which was very rare. Sure, I mean, there sure. was four breweries in New York City at the time. And what year was that? 2007. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I, I lived in New York City in 2007. And uh, yeah, I remember it was Kelso and Six Point and yeah. Brooklyn not, and yeah. Chelsea. <laughs> I mean, there was, yeah, there was no yeah. breweries. And so I just, you know, like I said, I had to take that opportunity. And so I I did the interview and... Yeah, thanks for starting all this after I left the city. I appreciate all that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. But, you know, I got the job and was here about a month afterwards. And I've been here ever since, about about six years in. Um, I I actually was a head brewer at Greenpoint for six years. It uh, It was a pretty interesting job because we actually... 
uh, aside from making Kelso and Heartland beers, we were also making beers for Six Point, Southampton, Great South Bay, uh, Coney Island. We, we had a whole, we had a, a pretty full roster, and yeah. so I got to meet a lot of the local characters and really get really engage in the local beer scene here over that time. And I think it was a good platform for us to launch our own brand because I already had a, you know, I had a lot of, I had a lot of access to people. Right. And I think that's, that's really key. Then you decided to start your own business with, uh, with two partners. And uh, I guess in 2013, you put it together and then opened in 2014. Yeah, we actually, you know, we signed the lease on our place in 2012. Oh, wow. It, okay. it takes a long time to accomplish things in New York. Yeah. And I think, you know, f- first off, people don't do manufacturing in New York city anymore. It's not, it, it doesn't make sense. Right. It's not cost effective and we are manufacturing. Yeah. Um, but we're a little bit different type of manufacturing. Sure, sure. We're more engaged with, we're more engaged directly with people. And, but you know, the biggest problem in New York is that nobody knows how to zone properly zone breweries. They want you to be in these crazy industrial locations. Yeah. And no brewery wants that. Everybody's trying to sure. be in lighter, lighter industrial zones. And so the struggle is to get through zoning right. variances with the Department of Buildings. It took us a year and a half to get open, basically. Yeah, yeah. And we, there was probably three months of construction work to be done. And it still took us a year and a half. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that, that's like a, that, was a, that, was a, that was a difficult thing for us to get through. Right, I mean, right. We basically went unpaid for a year and a half because we, we couldn't, you know, we didn't want to, we didn't want to ask for more money from investors and yeah. we didn't want to, we didn't want to, you know, damage the company before we opened. So we basically just damaged our own, mm. but you know, we made it, it was worth it. Right. I mean, that's, that's what opening a business is about. It's hard. Sure. Sure. So when you opened other half, uh, there seems to have been from the start a real clear aesthetic vision for a different kind of brewery both in the way that you sell beer and in the way that you design and, uh, you know, and the beers that you produce, which are, um, you know, have some, you know, common threads through them, uh, that are definitely on that progressive side. Tell me a little bit about how, wh- how you envisioned that and, uh, how you decided to make the beers, uh, you know, that you're now known for. So out the gate, we wanted to make IPA cause it was really something that wasn't being made in, in great quantity here. Yeah. Having grown up on the, on the West coast, it was something that was, that was everywhere. I mean, everybody sure. just, that's what you, that's what you would drink. And so I wanted to start out really strong with IPA. And the other thing that we were pretty serious about was branding. We wanted to change the way that, that our beers were branded because, yeah. um, a lot of that I would, you know, probably my wife's contribution to our vision is that, you know, she owned our gallery for 12 years. And I think that really changed the way I look, looked at, um, how we would brand what we're right. doing. I wanted to have a cleaner aesthetic. Um, you know, we don't have, uh, there's, there's no part of our design that really always continues through to another label, but other than having our logo on there, right. But you can tell it's another half label still. Sure. And that was sure. kind of, that was kind of a goal that we had with designers from the beginning was to make a cohesive brand that, but that was always different. That seems to carry through into the actual beer itself, you know, too, and uh, that kind of uh, contemporary, forward-looking. Let's make something in a different style, in a style that uh, isn't really being made right now, and see where we can, uh, you know, push this. Um, you know, c- creates kind of a cohesiveness between you know, even that visual brand image and what's inside the can, and they are cans. Um, you know, tell tell me a little bit about how you got into that kind of forward thinking, I won't we'll call it maybe New England or hazy style IPA. Um, but really that, you know, that focus on flavor more than bitterness in those IPAs, which, you know, in 2012, 2013, and this was, that was still very, very early days for that kind of, of style of IPA. And, you know, new hops were still coming online that made this kind of thing possible. Looking back at it now, it seems like, you know, brainer, but in hindsight's 2020 at the time had to be, uh, and, you know, there were some was something new to even try to focus a brewery around, uh, you know, kind of budding, nascent style. I w- you know, I would say one of the things that was most important in our decision was actually listening to the customers. Yeah. And 
that's something that I don't think that out of the gate that was something we had in mind. Hmm. I think that you know craft beer had been um, brewers, brewers like to you know dictate what they make like they're people get into beer because they want to make the beers they want to make right and I'm no different but you also have to listen to what you know you're a business at that point you have to listen to what the customers are, are asking for and so I just think that over time we tweaked it to get it into the beers that we love um, tweak it to get it into the range of what our customers were also asking for and is actually a le- I mean for me it's a big learning experience because um, you take a lot of things for granted. Right. You know, people just assume, oh, you know, people like West Coast IPA, we're going to make West Coast IPA. But if you're not, if you're not really aware, if you're not listening, you know, people will tell you what they want. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think I was that aware of, of how strong that was. Well, I, actually, to be fair, I think that the business changed five years ago anyways. Hmm. I don't think brewers really knew what customers wanted until uh, really the advent of things like, rape beer and beer advocate earlier on sure and sure. then five years ago i would say instagram and uh apps like untapped th- instead of it being at your computer it was at your phone yeah and so people were mobile with it and you know we see what people's responses are almost instantly to a new beer i mean yeah. i can within we can release a beer and 10 minutes later i know whether people <laughs> hate it or, yeah. or love yeah. it and so do you do that? You sit on Untapped and watch people rating the beer, uh, you know, within a half hour of when you release it. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't <laughs> obsessively look at it, but I check it because, hey. because I, we're not, we're not doing our due diligence on right, trying right. to make better products if we don't look and see what people are excited about. And right. we will always make, you know, right now the push is for is for New England IPA, for adjunct beers, and those are honestly those are kind of pushing the envelope on a lot of those like we we throw some stuff into beer that we're not 100 percent sure it's going to be great when we do it but yeah. we want to we want to take that risk because yeah. it's it is creating a unique product and i still love to make things like pilsners and hellas right. and you know even west coast ipa but um you know those are we all know how to do that i mean i've been brewing for 17 years now if i can't figure out how to make a pilsner yeah but it how do I how do I make a sour beer with fruit and graham cracker? Yeah, tastes good. I mean, that's not for everybody. I get it. Not sure. everybody that not everybody's going to want to drink that beer. But at, at the end, when we make something that is interesting and tastes good, and people are excited about, like I feel really good about that. I feel like we kind of accomplished something that is new and creative. And you know, I would say that I would say that the social media culture has allowed that to flourish. Yeah. Does sound like there's a, a good cent- like a circular feedback loop around that process. But then the other point that I think a lot of, you know, folks, you know, brewers have different opinions on is there are some brewers that for the rest of their career would love to hone and make one beer and perfect that. And then there are a whole lot of other brewers who'd get pretty bored if that was the rest of their life, you know, in the next several decades of the career only brewing one beer. And it seems like you all, try to balance that a little bit and uh, both keep it fun for yourself and for your consumers. Um, how, how challenging though, is it to keep up with what those customers demand? Because now what we've seen, you know, and when we look, look at craft beer culture, the thing that draw drew most people into craft beer is this idea of exploration and adventure. I mean, this is the reason that a lot of people even drink craft beer and aren't drinking macro beer. And so you start looking at that kind of psychology of a craft beer consumer. They're immediately someone who likes to try new things and different things. And so the beer world is kind of, you know, pumped steroids into that kind of mentality with that check-in culture and new beers all the time. But that creates pressure for you, you know, owning, operating a brewery, to be feeding into that same kind of thing. And, uh, you know, while there are some brewers that decry it and they, they, they hate this kind of culture of always new, um, you know, it's, it's hard to tell a consumer, you know, who's now been cultured and conditioned to enjoy that part of craft beer that they shouldn't be doing that. Um, you know, but then creating new things all the time has to be a gigantic pain in the ass for you. Uh, how do you manage that? And what does that creative process look like for you? It is, it is a lot of work. I'm, I mean, I, it's 
the volume the volume of of just label production <laughs> is right. it's it's a lot yeah, and yeah. it's a lot of pressure it's a lot of pressure on our company but you know we've built in systems to try to to like make that work and honestly i i love it like yeah. the opportunity to just keep making new things um i mean i when i worked at pyramid i probably made you know 200,000 barrels of pyramid hef like honestly that's not that that's not that entertaining yeah. and yeah. i've uh i would rather i would rather push the envelope make weird beers and see and see how they see how they land i just think it's a lot more fun and you know like i said i get it yeah. not everybody likes wacky flavored beer some people just want a good traditional hellas right and we will always as a brewery make those things but we can't we're not going to make large quantity of it because that's not what our focus is and it's also not really like what is selling beer right now right and we've i guess what we've always tried to do is try to keep creating enough volume in our brewery that we can go back we can make we can make our ipas we can make the the you know fruited sours and stouts and the more of those we make the more freedom it gives us in the back end to make some of the more traditional styles right and those sell really great in our tap room they just don't they don't move in cans. Yeah. <laughs> let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about your creative process in a second. But uh, but first, uh, great beers are made from select ingredients. With BSG, you'll bring the world to your brew house with an unparalleled and diverse selection of ingredients from across the globe to just down the road. Their dedicated customer service team and industry experience provides you with the assistance you need every step of the way. Let BSG be your supplier of choice for products essential to making great artisanal beverages so you can stay focused on your craft. For more information, visit them at bsgcraftbrewing.com or call them at 1-800-374-2739. Also, PackTech delivers the highest quality and most environmentally responsible packaging handles to the craft beer industry. PackTech handles are made from 100% post-consumer recycled material and are repurposed from milk jugs and similar containers. Their easy-to-carry and remove handles feature a minimalistic design that perfectly complement your beverage artwork eliminating the need for secondary packaging applied by hand or with automated applicators their packaging solutions deliver better market presence enhanced consumer value environmental awareness and improved sales Pactic handles are the smart and sustainable choice contact them today at 541-461-5000 visit their website at www.pactech that's p-a-k-t-e-c-h dash o-p-i dot com it was a it was a you know happy accident that you guys use all the products from our sponsors. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. So it just worked out nicely that way. Um, let's talk about that creative process. You know, we're we're sitting here in your old tap room and we're surrounded by the uh, lemons that have uh, some of which have been zested. You're you're you've got a bunch of experiments going with different kinds of ingredients. Um, how do you take uh, you know first to develop those ideas and then what does your process look like in terms of evaluating some of these ideas? How to add ingredients ingredients to the beer, when to add them, um, you know, how you, again, learn from that process and then improve, uh, you know, as you go with these specific ingredients. So I have a, I have a really great advantage here is that m- both of my partners were chefs prior to this. So, and, and actually we have a few other people on staff too that, that have worked. I mean, they all worked at Michelin star high end restaurants. They very savvy yeah. chefs and, um, we have a lot of discussions about the best way to get flavors into beers and we're pretty, you know, we're very focused on using real ingredients. Like when we make Imperial stouts that we put nuts in, like we're buying, we're buying nuts and toasting them in house and adding them into the beer. And really we're just looking for the best way to get, I would say primarily aromatics out of it, hmm. but then also cause that, that lends to people's perception of flavor, right? Like, that like having a very aromatic, beer um and, th- and this also extends to you know ipas having the aromatics is strongly affects people's perception in a way that you know it, it's how you how you make a soft beer yeah right you don't want to have you don't want it to be so aggressive on the on the flavor profile that it's you know uh resinous or overly bitter you want people to really pick up that the aromatics on the nose and it, but that's you know that's, that's how a, a lot of how, yeah. that's a lot of how we look at it. It's like, uh, 
aromas and textures. I think that there's a lot more focus right now in craft beer on the texture of beer. And I don't think that that wasn't really the case before. Yeah. Not, not as heavily as it is right now. Everybody's trying to figure out how to create different mouthfeels, how to balance things out to make, you know, like a lot of the sours are a lot more balanced than they used to be. Yeah. And I think that that's just, that's again, that's the, that's the general public being like, Hey, I love these styles, but I want it to be more balanced. And I think that a lot of people are just in general are heading that direction. Um, but mouthfeel, mouthfeel, like hear that over and over again. Everybody, everybody wants to constantly describe the mouthfeel of a beer and how good it is. That, and you, then, then you realize how important that is to people. Right. So. That becomes, uh, you know, even for the, the kind of consumer that's buying, you know, your beers, whether that's a soft IPA or whether that's a, a super thick imperial stout with, uh, you know, all sorts of ingredients, um, that becomes that, that first thing that you know you'll if you read those reviews that uh, that a consumer is going to mention yep they're going to mention it was so thick so thick yep. um uh you know they don't necessarily mention the aroma as much although they don't realize that what that's doing and you know but i, I like that idea that uh, aroma is this additional way to balance out you know other potentially strong flavors in that beer um how do you maintain aroma through your brewing process, you know, I mean, that's, I think one of the biggest challenges that, that brewers, you know, making hoppy beers, you know, face, and of course, you know, any beer that, you know, depends on that kind of aroma, um, at every moment throughout the production process, you know, those aromas are, are trying to get out of that beer, you know, the you're producing CO2. And every time you do that, that's, that's trying to scrub aroma straight out of your beer. What do you, you know, what, how do you keep all of these things that you work so hard to create in the beer and uh, you know not let them uh, escape and, and turn into you know kind of blandness. Yeah, I mean you you definitely that's why that's why dry hopping has become so popular. Yeah, you know you really are trapping a lot more of the aromas. Um, you know, a hard one a hard one for us. You know, I think we lose we lose some of our aromatics carbonating the beer. We yeah. don't. You know, we're we're in a tight space. We can't just sit on beer and let it let it carbonate for five days under pressure like we have to force carbonate to get it done right um just because we just don't have space like i don't have extra tank space for yeah, that kind of thing yeah. in brooklyn it's the, you know our square footage is small compared to what most breweries sure, that sure. our size work in um so we struggle a little bit with that but you know i guess we make up for it by just using a lot of hops <laughs> um yeah and yeah that's 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 really for us the only way we can manage that yeah do you uh you know when, when you dry hop um you know do you have you developed some techniques that are particularly good at, at kind of you know keeping that aromatic feel in the beer itself um you opening tanks and dropping them in or are you uh you know using some strategies that that uh you know, yeah we keep that inside we go ahead and just use we have a dry hop port in the top of the tank yeah we've we've played around with recirculating hops yeah i just for me that pulls out some astringencies i don't like okay so we've always just stuck with throwing hops in and i think we i think we get good results i'm happy with it mm -hmm. um but yeah i try to anything I, anything we can do to avoid pulling out green character right. from hops i try to do are there specific hops that uh, give you less green character that uh you know that you tend to go back to because of uh of how they work in the in your dry hopping for the most part all hops eventually will mellow out yeah and i think that you know we're not really focused we're we're focused on using a variety of hops right that's one thing we've always done is use a broad spectrum of hops one because we love them like right. i love i mean there's a lot of varieties we don't get to brew with that much that i love because they're just not that popular but they will all eventually hit a good spot and you know we have a we have a pretty we have a pretty aggressive packing s schedule. I mean, we don't, we really can't wait. We just don't have the space. Yeah. And so we package beers and sometimes they're probably a little, some, some of them are perfect. Some of them are greener than we want when they get packaged. But I think a lot of our customer base knows if they buy the beer and wait a week, it's going to start hitting its stride. And they all do that. Some, some faster than others. I mean, you know, sometimes galaxy can, you have to be patient with that one. Yeah. It's a, it's, very high alpha, very aggressive, yeah. but it mellows, it mellows into such a great spot when it's, when it's 
you know, yeah. when it gets there, it's great. So, you guys use any biotransformation, uh, you know, effects? Are you uh, dry hopping before the end of fermentation, or uh, do you do you finish them off and then dry hop? I mean, we usually we usually are dry hopping pretty much right at the tail end. Okay. We usually catch a, you know, usually we'll still have some drop in gravity after we dry hop, and part of that could be uh, enzymatic reaction sure. from the hops, but. Uh, I, I mean, I think that, you know, you could throw them in earlier, but I don't like to harvest yeast off of tanks that yeah. have hops yeah. in them already. So we kind of try to time it to get that harvesting done and add the hops right at the tail end. And it works. It, I think it works great for us. Never, you know, never really had a, a problem with it. Yeah. Um, and I assume you just, you know, uh, keep it at typical fermentation temps in the, the high 60s, low 70s when you're when you're dry hopping. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I mean, it, there's not a whole lot of like, there's not a whole lot of yeah. secrets about it. I think everybody, everybody's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Sure. And at, sure. When, at the end of the day, everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah. Maybe Maybe slight tweaks here and there, but um, it's, it's a, it's, it's funny because I think a lot of people assume that there's different things happening and, and honestly brewery to brewery people are doing very similar things but end up with different results yeah and i'm not i'm i'm never sure where that comes from i'm right. always it's that's that's one thing i'm always very curious about you know and that's that's why i ask these questions because you're right like everyone you know professionally brewers are sharing their techniques and their approach and uh, you know and still you're right getting wildly different uh results at times from doing the same kinds of things um, you know, if someone else was trying to use Henry from Mungish's dry hop regimen, like it just wouldn't produce the same kind of beer because um, I've had those. <laughs> yeah, it's just you know, and, and you know, but but drinking your beer, there's still some, there's a soft quality to it and an integrated quality to that kind of dry hopping that is harder to find, and, and you know, even some of your contemporaries here in New York City, um, you know, had. It, can you you can't put any point on what it is that that helps you know pull that together in a in such a cohesive way no Where's i mean <laughs> the, the one thing the one thing we do and i don't i don't know how many people um that drink these styles of beer know this but there's like an early on an early perception that the style of ipa was just lazy brewing yeah and we centrifuge every single beer that comes out of here. Mm. So there's intentionality behind it. Right. Like we have a, we have a vision of what we want the beer to look like at the end. And, uh, you know, we, every beer, I think we probably do get some benefit from centrifuging it. It kind of cleans up, it kind of cleans the beer up a little bit and we still have hazy IPA. It's not, right. It's not coming out clear. Um, (laughs) so but I, I think sure that, no that's a mis- misconception there i mean if you if you left yeast in the beer like it wouldn't stay in suspension and then right and then it drops out and then it pulls out that hops character because you know those yeast particles grab on those little polyphenols and yeah just, you can you know you can tell the difference you right. can always tell if you if you open a month old can of new england style ipa and there's sediment at the bottom you know that there was still some yeast in suspension but you can open up these these beers in a month a month after, and there's nothing in the bottom of the can, but it's still a very hazy beer. Yeah. So uh, it's yeah. I, I think that there's a lot of misconception about it. Right. I think people are coming around and understanding that. Like. Yeah. Well, yeah. Do you do you have any you, you, uh, any mash strategies to you know produce that kind of state uh, haze stability in the beer? You guys step mash or uh, no? no? Well. <laughs> nope. Well, all right then. <laughs> Keep it simple. Just uh, you know, varying quantities of of wheat and oats depending on the beer. Or yeah, we 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 use a lot of oats and we use some wheat, and I I that definitely contributes. But um, it's I think it's I do think it's just biotransformation and the volume of hops we're using. There's just a lot of there's a lot of material in the beer, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what are some of your favorite hops combinations? You know, you, uh, you know, other brewers that I've talked to um, have sung your praises in terms of being able to evaluate and you know build blends when they've collaborated with you, and uh, so you've you've developed a reputation for being uh, particularly good at uh, you know at rubbing hops and you know figuring out blends that uh, produce great beers. Um, you know, from wow, that's that's. 
Well, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm mean, not just trying to, you know, fluff it up, but I mean, I have had brewers tell me that, like, you know, Sam came in here, we rubbed some hops, and I mean, you know, we put it together, and it was just a fantastic combination, you know, that, uh, um, you know, but from your perspective, how do you, how did you build that, um, that skill, that talent, that experience, and then, you know, what have you found in doing that that, you know, that you particularly like, or that you, you know, as you're evaluating hops, uh, how you make some decisions about what to use and what not to use? I mean, that all, starts, that all starts with hop selection, and that's something that we've been trying to be as involved with as possible from the get-go. You really only get to select hops at a certain volume, so uh, it, it does pay to be slightly bigger. Yeah. And that's been a, a big motivator for us is that we can, we can, you know, people automatically assume as you get bigger that you're going to, uh, they're going to start falling off, the beer's not going to be as good, but honestly... Um, when you have good systems in place and you know we have we have a tremendous brew staff here that really knocks it out of the park yeah. all the time and when you have that in place you're you're good and then it's yeah. really sourcing your ingredients and being I think that point gets lost on a lot of your consumers you know and beer consumers in general that uh, like you say they expect oh they got so big and they're not paying attention but you know, you have to do a certain volume and then your order in line to choose hops is based on that kind of, you know, how much business you do. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, right. Being, you know, how, how many barrels do you all produce generally a year now? Or? We did 14,000 barrels oh last year. Out of this tiny brewery mm -hmm. here in Brooklyn? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yep. Like I said, we have, I mean, this is, this is what I, this is why I was just saying our brew staff's <laughs> incredible yeah. because the space, yeah. the space here is intense. They deal, we, we've been trying to continually upgrade the brewery and there's a lot of construction going on around them while they're yeah. trying to work. It's it's not always the easiest work environment. Sure, sure. And I th I think they make magic happen here, and uh, it's you know it's important to have that. Like I said, once you have that, the consist the consistency of your brand is about your people. Yeah. Um, and I think we're good on that. And like I said, so then my my job is to make sure that we're selecting the best ingredients, the best hops. Yeah. And you know, like I said, with my partners, their chefs, we they are very help. They're very useful in helping us evaluate kind of some of the adjuncts we add into beers. And then on the hop end of things, we go to Yakima every year and we select. You know, we select as many hops as they'll let us. You know, yeah. whatever varieties they'll let us get our hands on, we do and. We sometimes we, you know, like last year we we rubbed hops with the with the crew from Burial and Stillwater and Cloudwater, and they all just they came to our selection because they wanted to see what we were getting and just, but the, you know having these having these opportunities for us to all be in the same room rubbing hops talking about it, that's invaluable, um, but not all hops are the same. Yeah, and it's it really. It's incredibly important. I think people underestimate the importance of being able to, to select your own hops. So, um, when you're selecting, are you uh, you know, I, and, and various brewers select with different things in mind. You know, talking to you know Wayne from Cigar City, like he is, uh, you know, mentioned that he is looking for a very tight range uh, and exactly the 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 type of this variety that they started brewing, you know, with initially and only wants to, you know, that it doesn't matter if it's a better or good or, you know, they have some objective uh, uh, reaction to, the, you know, uh, certain lots from this variety. If it's not to that spec, he doesn't want those hops. And then there are, you know, certainly other, other brewers I've talked to have that, you know, if we find this fantastic lot, even if it's only a smaller amount and we can't get a whole bunch of it, we, you know, we'll buy it and make something special with it. Um, you know, what kind of philosophy do you take around around selecting hops in that way? Yeah, we always try to just select what we think is the best. Yeah. I, as much as I want consistency of the beers throughout the year, honestly, if we can get a lot of Citra, that's the best lot I've ever experienced, but we can only get one pallet of it and it's yeah. only going to last us a month. All right. Well, we're gonna do the best citrus beers we've ever done for the month. <coughs> but yeah, we're but we're we're in a position where our customer is. I don't know that they're as sensitive to slight changes. Yeah, it's more about is it good or not. People just want really good beer, and I don't think you know if we get two different citrus lots, is the difference so much that people are going to be annoyed that it tastes a little different? I don't think so. When they have that one lot that's incredible, they're going to remember that one because 
it, it does make that much of a difference. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we don't... It doesn't screw you up later on when they have the next batch. Like, this wasn't as good as the, uh, the last one. I'm willing to risk that. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, you don't want to yeah. pass... You don't want to pass up on something that's right, incredible. Right. And I, I always... I always feel that way. Like, you just want... I always want to just have the best hops we can yeah. get. And that's... You know, when we, when, we look at, when we look at hops, I'm looking... F- I don't even care if the hop... Like, for, for example, our Simcoe we selected this year and last year... I wouldn't. I would not call it traditional Simcoe. Like what yeah. I what I rem, what I've always experienced from Simcoe is not in this hop, but it's such a unique, amazing expression of what Simcoe is or could be that we had to. We we're like, this is this is the one for us because we're looking for we're looking for more soft fruit forward flavors from the hops yeah. and. You know, you're gonna when you go to sit in a room and select hops, you're gonna get some that are more diesel character, more more unctuous like garlic onion character, and then you're gonna get some that are just really fruit forward. And for us, those are the ones we want. But every brewery is different. I know I, there are a lot of breweries that kind of like the more aggressive, dank diesel right. versions, and that's why everybody makes different beers. Yeah. So, uh, I we we have our vision. And it works for us, and that's what we sit in the room and look for: is how do we get these like juicy, sweet, soft hop aromas? Um, do you work? I assume you know, like a lot of breweries, you work off of you know common base recipes and are, are you know uh, you know changing a few things here for each of these new releases. But you can by doing that still build an experience with with those kinds of base beers. How many different uh, you know say? base IPA, double IPA kind of, you know, recipes do you work from and how do you make some decisions about how to, you know, take those, whether you add, uh, you know, a, a lactose component to it or, or how you tweak those various variables and then come up with something that's also new and interesting, but built off of that experience that you have. Honestly, we don't have that many base recipes. Oh. Like I'm sure our brew staff would love it if I streamlined it a little better, but I, I tend to tweak things a lot. Yeah. We do have some, we do have some series you just keep creating new recipes all the time yeah i i mean i feel like i'm always <laughs> looking for ways yeah, to improve yeah. it or change it i mean i feel like if we're presenting a new beer to people i want it to feel like a new beer yeah and so yeah we'll we'll change the grain bill it's but you know these are it's like a constant opportunity for us to experiment <clears throat> and see if we can find something that we like better yeah um but this goes back to the whole discussion of, you know, new for everybody. I kind of, I guess I kind of fall into that culture too. Like I want to make, I want to do new stuff. I want to try new right. things and we're, we're constantly doing that. So, yeah. Um, let's go back and talk about, you know, some of the, the stout ingredients a little bit, you know, we've, we've gotten our, our hops out of the way here, I think, um, you know, uh, like I said, you know, you, you all are, you know, figuring out how to add some of these ingredients, whether you're talking about toasted nuts, you know, earlier, um, can be really challenging into a beer. Uh, and, and you all, uh, they can also create terrible results, especially as the oils and some of these things start to, you know, fighting with that very core of the beer. Um, you know, have, what, what kind of methods for adding things like nuts into your, into your beers have you found to, to kind of give you better results? Uh, usually, I mean the basically, I mean the best way to add them in is cold side. Yeah, it's where it's where you're going to get the most character out of them. Okay, so that's that's what we do with a lot of these things. There's a little more risk involved because <laughs> yeah. you're, yeah. you're adding a nut into a, basically a finished beer, but that's that's you know. That, that's that's yeah, the how best do you way. how do you uh, you know sterilize or pasteurize that before uh, before you throw it into your beer and, and not kill the whole thing off heat yeah yeah you, toasting is enough to to do it or are you uh maybe oh, oh okay I mean this is this is this <laughs> is the, enough, this is enough. the thing I think that yeah. uh, a lot of people need to understand with these beers is that uh, I I wouldn't age an adjunct stout for a very long time. From a consumer side, yeah, I yeah. mean, it's not that's not what they're made for, and right. I, I think there's always there's always misconceptions about how long beer in any any beer in any packaging style should be stored for. I mean, yeah, 
people think that they can hold in the crawlers. Like, it's, no, crawlers drink that right away. That's yeah. not that's not a that's not an ideally packaged product. Um, with the stouts, I mean, I feel relatively. Um, I feel relatively comfortable that if people drink any of those within six months, they're not going to have a problem. Yeah. But um, you're, you really shouldn't be aging Imperial stouts that are adjuncted. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, you can age Imperial stouts that are not, um, and a lot of the barrel stuff too. But, you know, you're going to, those flavors, those flavors are going to fade over time anyway. Yeah. So it's really better to, to drink them in the first six months. Yeah, I think. For most beers, especially for stouts, uh, aging is completely overrated, and that uh, you know, unless you really like that kind of raisiny Belgian character that's going to start coming out after a few years, most people don't look for that in their stouts. And so you, you know, um, that does raise a question though, and I and I, I think philosophically speaking, you know, you, we do find a lot of brewers, you know, on that more traditional conservative side who say. You know, you have a duty to your consumer to make sure that this beer has longevity when you package it, and if you're going to sell it to them that way, you know, then uh, then it's your responsibility to make sure that it's right. Um, you know, on the flip side, I think most consumers today are both comfortable and not comfortable with that concept. They're comfortable with the concept of, I know my IPA should be drunk within you know probably four to eight weeks, you know, in order for it to be ideal, and then after that, it's you know probably going to fall off. Um, you know, especially as they're buying cans and they've been kind of conditioned around that, uh, maybe a little bit different. You know, in that in that world of stouts, where um, you know, and then they, they still have to balance that idea of some are buying to trade and some are you know are, are swapping them and sitting around the country. Uh, but these things aren't necessarily made for that kind of transit. Although you know, you're you're you kind of depend upon that to you know, keep moving the kind of volumes of beer that you do. How do you how do you balance that expectation from a consumer, you know, and that integrity of the package, um, while at the same time continuing to you know push boundaries and do new things? Well, uh, first off, I'm just going to address the age of beer thing. Okay. I, I mean, I think people were conditioned to think it's okay for beer to be six months old. I, I think that's that's ridiculous. We're yeah. only people are people are trying to achieve stability in these beers for the distro market, right? And, the distro market's not really good for beer. It's just not. It's yeah. too, it, you know, really large breweries are trying to fill the pipeline for like five to six months out. Yeah. And I don't want my beer to be six months, five or six months old when it goes to a shelf. That's, I don't, yeah. I don't want that. That's right. not, that's not right. I don't think it's right. I mean, I think you're right. And I think that idea that beer should be that way is an idea that was conditioned by those large brewers. Absolutely. And why do we why do any of us need to play by those rules just because that's the way they did it to serve, you know, serve their business? Yeah, to be clear, I'm not being critical sure. of them. I sure. I understand why that system is in place and how it works. I mean, yeah. it, it has to be that way. Right, right. But we don't operate in that but system. But it doesn't have to be the only way. And it doesn't have to be the only way. Yeah. So, we're we're, you know, for me, I like I I feel I feel very confident that people can hold on to our IPAs for three or four months and they're still going to, they're still going to taste great. They're going to, they're going to change. They're yeah. going to evolve. Um, they'll probably be less intense at three or four months, but it's going to still be a good beer. And I think that people have this misconception about New England style IPA. Oh, you got to drink it right away. Oh, you got to drink it in two weeks. And honestly, I think it's better about a month in. And yeah. then when it's really, really, it's, it's like pasta sauce. You got to let it meld. <laughs> and I think it improves. And so, yeah, that idea. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not into it, but I do think that, uh, as long as people are drinking, you know, beer within six months, which I think is what they should be doing. Yeah. Unless it's, I mean, obviously there's, there are specific styles that I think you can hold on to a lot longer and, and, and that's okay. But I think, you know, there's no there's no reason to hold on to an adjunct stout or an IPA for longer than you know six months. Yeah, where does your responsibility as a brewer to your consumer end? Then is is that at six months? I mean, you know, this is it's a strange thing that we start start seeing in the beer world now, where you know a year in some a beer develops some strange uh, you know starts developing some off flavors you know and something happened to be in there and. It sat warm at seventy degrees in somebody's basement for for a year, and and now it's expressing a different kind of character that's not what the brewer intended. You know, does uh, you know, 
is, is it the brewer's responsibility then, you know, a year after the fact to, you know, to make good on that because they somehow failed a consumer? I mean, yeah, these aren't, it's not a cut and dry question. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, these are kind of, kind of, you know, things you have to feel your way through. Uh, it's a, it's definitely a gray area. I yeah. mean, you want, you want to know that people are storing the beer properly. I think that all beer should be stored cold. Yeah. And that's not what happens, but, um, you know, it is it is our responsibility as brewers to try to educate people on how they should store their beer a little bit since we're we're, you know, selling them a product. So, you know, we're if we feel like if we feel like, first off, I don't want anybody to be disappointed ever. Yeah. Our our business is built upon making people happy and I want people to have a good time and feel good about our products. And and if there is something wrong with one of our beers, we will take care of it. Yeah. And. You know, I mean, I'm not going to, if someone brings me a bottle we released three years ago, but they just opened and said it was bad, I'm probably going to, that's, that's a, they're going to have to just eat that one. That's, that's a little too far out. But if yeah, somebody brings yeah. a beer back and they're like, Hey, this was infected, you know, I'm not, like, I'm not here to, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of, but I also don't want people to be disappointed. So yeah, we always try to make it right in some way. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't had a lot of, ha- we haven't had really much of that happen, but you know, even people just break glassware. Yeah. Like we've, you know, people have walked out the door, dropped a glass on the sidewalk and we're like, well, here's another one, you know, <laughs> like it's not as, I don't want to do that all the time, but yeah. you, you want to take care of your customers. Right. So those are the people right. that are, those are the people that keep your lights on. That creates a, you know, a positive experience for them where, you know, you as a business are going above and beyond and they know you don't have to do that, but they also know that you care about that. And I mean, you know, when you're talking about beer, you're trying to, you know, it's not about making one sale. It's about building a relationship, you know, of your brand with that consumer, you know, and and fans so that they keep coming back and keep buying your thing. And that that becomes that way to build a more longstanding relationship rather than this kind of short one. Um, so probably a better long-term payoff for that. Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I know, I know it works. I mean, we've, yeah. we've developed kind of what I consider what we have around our brewery as a community. There's a lot of people that come here on a regular basis and they're, they're friends with each other and they've, we've, we've built up. It's more than just a brewery now. It's like, yeah. a, it, it is, it is a community here and we're, I mean, I think we're incredibly lucky that that's yeah. sprung up around us. So. That's, you know, and I think that's probably both a blessing and a curse. And I'd love to talk to that for, you know, for a minute, this uh, line culture of when you release a new beer, you know, you got folks or, you know, you just went through your anniversary, your fifth anniversary week and uh, released new beers all week long. And there were folks, you know, lining up the night before and putting chairs out and, uh, you know, folks hiring people to stand in line for them and the, the whole nine yards. And, and uh, uh, I, I joined your Other Half Everything Facebook group to watch this uh, from afar, you know, a few months ago. And it's been fascinating to watch both the kind of polarizing opinions, um, you know, that your hardcore fans have where they love things and they hate things. And all those passions, you know, kind of kind of come to a head for you as a business. How do you, you know, I mean, the passion is great. You want your consumers to be that excited about what you do to where they want to do this, but it also creates a crazy responsibility to fulfill those kinds of expectations and to also kind of make sure the experience as people come and do that together is, is a good one and not just a negative one. How do you, how do you deal with that? How do you deal with the, that kind of, that kind of feedback and, uh, and some of the, the pain that comes from that level of passion and excitement? So right away, we've just, we've kind of come to the conclusion that we are now more of a hospitality company almost than a brewery. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, our main goal, like we're trying to take care of people that come here and we do so much of our business direct to customer that yeah. we've realized that that is, that is how we have to focus our energies is making sure that people feel taken care of and that when they stand in line, that they're going to get the beer they want. And managing all that is, you know, it, it took a lot of, it took a lot of time to figure out our, you know, my partner, Andrew has been done the lion's share of the work on that. And it, there was always going to be people that are upset about certain aspects of it. Um, and, you know, we hear about that usually through social media, but there's always the, you know, the, the majority of people are not complaining and you just see the ones that are, but 
we've worked we've worked really hard to streamline all of our processes, make the lines short, and also we've 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 tried to make more beer because ultimately the thing that the thing that solves a lot of the problems is making beer available to people and it's kind of cool to have people freak out and wait in line and you blow through all the beer in two hours and you're done and like that's a that's a you know i guess you know your ego loves that you're like oh that's cool everybody loves our beer but then you realize that there's so many people that are missing out on the opportunity to try the beer and that's not really as a company we want more people to try it so we've been striving to make more beer and make it more accessible and we have these you know we still have some crazy releases like obviously our fifth anniversary was insane right and but that's not how it's normally that's not how it normally is around here you know on a saturday there'll be people here waiting in line they'll buy some beer and then we'll have some beer left over and then people come all day long and buy the remaining beer because they know now they don't have to do the line thing but that I think what people need to realize about the line, the line culture is, is that it's not just about the beer. Everybody, everybody's like, why would anybody wait in line for beer? That's crazy. And that's not, that's not what it is, man. This is, it's about, it's about the community that builds up around it. Um, I always, I kind of compare it obviously in a much smaller scale to like a Grateful Dead concert and people like traveling around following these things. And these people, they form community and friendships and everybody's doing it because they like hanging out together. And that's really what's happened with, you know, the, our customers, they're very involved with each other. They hang out, they come here because they want to see each other and hang out. And it's not just about, it's not just about the beer we're selling. It's, it's about the community that's come up around it. And uh, like a perfect example for our pre, the week before our anniversary, we released a lot of, collabs we had done over the years with other breweries and that we liked customers liked so it's kind of a curated list and we actually let some of our best customers do posts so they they wrote the posts they took the photos they prepped it all and first they were excited to do it and then when they posted it and their friends saw that they had done the post for it they were like excited for each other and like just the amount of energy around that and how excited people were and just the positivity. It was amazing. And that's, that's like, we, we knew that was there, but watching that was, it was, it was incredible. So you're building not just fans, but advocates and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, engaging those folks that are influential, even in, in what you do as this running this hospitality business. These are, I mean, these are the people that keep keep our lights on. Yeah. Like, I, 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 for us, we just see it as our duty to help. Like, I, if I want them to have the best experience they possibly can have, and you know, we're like even our anniversary party itself is largely people that we invite that are yeah that are great customers, and it's it's free. It's yeah. our, it's our like thank you to them for and. and we're, we've also been really focused on trying to steer away from the negativity. There's a lot of you see a lot of negativity online right. with on social media, and we will never ever engage that. Yeah, you will never see us respond to that. And sometimes it's you know it's painful to see people say things, critique things, and you know you're trying your best right. to help everybody, and you're like, man, why are people still going after us? And you know, but I think that because we've largely ignored it and tried to stay positive that most of that has gone away and we have I think we have a really positive community that's up, built up around the brewery now um, you're uh, in the midst of some significant expansions you're, you're opening up a brewery in Rochester that uh, you know you've purchased from a defunct brewery and are uh, you know spinning that up as and you're going to focus on some different kinds of beer up there you just announced you're going into a new spot in Williamsburg here in Brooklyn to open a second, uh, you know, brewery tap room. In, in today's environment, you have, uh, you know, an increasing number of breweries or what appears to be an increasing number of breweries, you know, citing like market uh, conditions for, you know, going out of business and, and uh, putting, you know, taking these businesses down. Um, you know, you know, it's starting to become a kind of common mantra across the craft beer world. Like, oh, the market's getting so hard. It's, you know, it's tough to, to build in it. In the midst of this environment, you guys are 
undertaking some pretty significant expansion. Um, you know, how do you, how, how do you, how's that jive? Like, how do you, how, like, you know, make sense of the fact that certain, you know, there's market contraction or at least a market plateau that's creating pressure for, for some folks and, uh, you know, making their, you know, that light at the end of the tunnel for their businesses kind of, you know, uh, fall off while at the same time, you know, there are still opportunities for, you know, that you see out there in the market that you're willing to invest in and, uh, and to grow your business. Um, you know, what, how does, how does that work? And uh, where, what do you see the opportunity there? Well, I think the misconception is that we're going to be producing a lot of beer. Yeah. I mean, we are adding capacity outside of Rochester of about 5,000 barrels. That is not very much beer. Right, right. Um, what we are trying to do is create more direct customer uh, situations. And, you know, that's what we're, that's, I think that's one of our strengths is that we, you know, we're very good. Our staff is very good at engaging the public and being involved. And like I said, we've become more of like a hospitality company almost at this point because of that. And I think that there's no better way there's no better way to get customers than to be able to engage them directly. And the more, yeah. the more opportunities we create for that, the better at Williamsburg, you know, also in New York city, it's like four miles from us. <laughs> right. But yeah, but New York city is such a big place that there's people that live in Williamsburg that will never come to our brewery here just because it's super inconvenient for them. Yeah. But we do want to, again, we're not, we want to have, we want to create opportunities for people to come and engage us directly. And I think when people get the opportunity to come to our brewery and meet our people that they want to come back. And so, you know, we're going to have a small brewery in Williamsburg, um, just cause we like to have beer made on location. Yeah. Um, I think that's really, I think that's really important, but it's, it's not going to be very much beer. It's just not like, we're not, right. we're not, right. I think that's, I think that's the, the problem with the industry right now is that, the the older model which is breweries going only distro your margins are so terrible until you get to a really large size and then when you get to that large size then you're vulnerable to changes in the market and so it's it's hard to be nimble and change and you really can't pull back when you've invested in producing and creating a really large brewery and i think that you know that's where the that's where the fear is right now i think staying small like you know people automatically are like, oh my God, other hats getting so big. It's not, we're not getting that much bigger, yeah. but we are trying to, we are trying to just have more direct customer opportunity. Yeah. Now this will barely, barely squeak you into that kind of regional brewery category from your, your current small category. Um, now that's an interesting point that, you know, that for these businesses and, and you know, you do have to kind of manage and keep your production just under the, that ultimate demand for it. Um, but I have to kind of track that. And how do you, how do you, you know, even pay attention to that, uh, you know, and, you know, analyze like, you know, how much more you can grow? Well, I mean, I think we're, we've been lucky so far in that our, the amount of beer we make has just been dictated by the amount of space we have. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I said, in the beginning, we couldn't produce that much beer. We didn't have the equipment we needed right. to do it. And we would have can releases and we didn't have enough beer. And people just gave up. Yeah. And so then it kind of looked like, well, this is the amount of beer we can sell. But really what happened is we made more beer. We were able to expand and make more beer available. And then the people that didn't want to wait in line came back. Yeah. And that's like, like I said, that's ultimately what we want. It's like we have, we have the customers that want to have the experience of hanging out with their, with their friends and our yeah. staff and be part of the culture here at the brewery. And then there's customers that are like, I just wanted to come get beer yeah, and leave. Yeah. And I want to, we wanted to be able to respect both of those groups of people right? and make it, make it fun for the people that are, that are like here all the time and love it and part of the culture. And, you know, yeah, that's, I think that's an interesting piece. Like um, when I was up at Treehouse a few months ago, they were, we were talking to them and they were saying, you know, with the original brewery, and the small can limits that they, that they of the beer that they could produce, you know, they could draw on about an hour, you know, uh, uh, circumference around the or uh, uh, radius around the brewery, an hour in any direction, you know, because that's about as far as somebody was willing to go drive to go line up and wait for a couple hours to get six cans of something, you know, like you know, yeah, we, you know, like it's just not. But now, 
you know, when they were projecting for the new brewery with this larger volume, they started, you know, if now people can come and buy a couple of cases, well, that, that radius gets out to about a three hour thing because now somebody can come and they, you know, once a month rather than once a week, you know, but they can stock up. And that seems to be a similar dynamic for you where now it's worth it for people to make the trip, you know, um, because they can get more, even if they're not coming as often, you know, they, they can make any individual trip more worthwhile for them. Absolutely. I mean, we have so many tourists here yeah. and I don't, I don't mean just from, you know, we're on the, we're on the East coast. We have tourists from the UK. I mean, we have a lot of UK tourists, people from Brazil all the time, yeah. just Europe in general. And I mean, you don't want them to be, you don't want them to be disappointed, right? Like they come here and we don't have cans, Yeah. but now we do. And I, you know, I see this all the time. People are like, oh, are you guys going to have cans? And it's like, we will have something. It may not be the thing that you're yeah. looking for yeah. specifically, um, but we, we always have something. Yeah. And, you know, it'll, it'll, if you don't come, if you see us post a beer you're excited about and you don't come within a day or two, you might miss it, yeah. but there will be something else. Right. And that's really, you know, that's, it's, that's way preferable. The last thing right. I want to do is have people come here that traveled from, you know, 3000 miles away and say, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. that doesn't, that doesn't make us feel good. Like we want to, we want to make things available to people because that's how you make people happy. Yeah. So what's next? What do you, what's exciting you about beer in general right now? Well, I mean, I think for us, I think we're pretty comfortable in our, in our own clothes when it comes to the IPA game. Um, we're feeling pretty good about stouts. Um, I think that the thing that we're most excited about right now is, uh, is our, it's going to be a while, so don't jump the gun, <laughs> but we are working on a, on actually having a mixed culture, spontaneous brewery upstate. Right. I mean, it's not a separate brewery. It's part of our yeah, Rochester yeah. location, but we brought on, uh, Eric Salazar from new Belgium, uh, this month. Yeah. And we're going to start working on that program. I don't expect that to be our bread and butter, but it's a it's a passion project for us. I mean, that we're that we are interested in, and I'm hoping we're going to get people really interested in. Um, you know, it's for us. It's about just expanding our offerings to people, and and I mean, I'll keep, tell you right, I tell you right now, it's yeah. what gets our brewers excited. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, uh, I, I think that's right. It keeps it, it's something new for you all to tackle to make something that you enjoy drinking and, uh, you know, to add your particular vision and spin onto, you know, what another half version of those kinds of beers could be. Yeah. It's going to be, yeah, I'm excited about it. Cool. Awesome. Well, we're excited to have you come up to, to Maine for our, uh, our Brewers Retreat in Booth Bay Harbor. And, uh, you know, if anyone out there wants to brew with Sam on a, 15 gallon homebrew set up this summer uh, there are only a few more tickets uh, left for that one at uh, brewersretreat.com it's going to be a great time we've got some you know, awesome folks coming up and uh, yeah look forward to you joining us for yeah that. I'm looking forward to it as well cool um, many thanks to our sponsors that helped us bring you this episode g and Chillers sets the standard for glycol chilling celebrate the best hobby there is at homebrew con BSG ingredients bring the world to your brew house and pack tech handles are the smart and sustainable choice Sam, thanks for joining us on the Craft Beer and Brewing Podcast. Appreciate you taking time out of this busy uh, start of New York Beer Week. And yeah, thanks uh, for having me. Of course. We'll see you soon. Okay. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. For those that love to make and drink great beer, learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew.